are back in uh, John's Gospel, in John chapter 4. And rather than reading the whole text again, what I'd like to do is just simply begin in verse 19 and read through verse 24. I trust you remember the rest of the context. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 19, the woman said to him, <clears throat> Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. Now, remember this morning that uh, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman when she asked whether uh, Gerizim or Jerusalem was the right place to worship, that it really was Jerusalem, but with the coming of the new covenant, it's really now no longer either of these places because the place doesn't matter. What really matters is the heart. Jesus says that God is spirit, and that means, of course, not only what He is in essence, but what He is morally, what His nature is like. Those who worship Him must worship in spirit, which means, of course, not just from our souls or from our hearts, but from hearts that are cleansed by God's grace uh, through faith so that we might worship Him in the love that the Spirit of God actually creates within us. Again, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, whatever we offer to the Lord means nothing to Him if it isn't offered with the right motive. And that motive needs to be love. It's not the love we work up in our own natures, but rather it is the love that God gives to us by His Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. But as we also saw this morning, there is more than just worshiping in spirit. Jesus said, he is seeking those who worship in spirit and in truth. Now, God delights uh, in various things, and among other things, uh, He delights in being worshipped for who He is and in the way that He requires. He does not delight in false worship. God isn't pleased if we come to Him with wrong ideas, either of what He is, what He is like or how he would be worshipped. Jesus points that out to the Samaritan woman in verse 22. You worship what you do not know. And I think he means here not just that they don't know him personally because they hadn't come to know him. Salvation was from the Jews, not from the Samaritans. But also they did not know who he was and how to worship him. He says, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. God had revealed Himself to the Jews, but He had not revealed Himself to the Samaritans. Now again, as I mentioned this morning, Samaritans were a half Jewish, half pagan, actually maybe more than, than half pagan. The king of Assyria had taken the Jews away into captivity and he had settled men, well, people from, from every nation that they had conquered under heaven, from Babylon, from Kutha, from Ava, from Hamath, and from Sefer Vaim. And we read actually in 2 Kings 17 that when he settled the people in the land, uh, because the people did not know God and because that land was, was basically sacred to him, as they worshiped these other gods, the Lord brought judgment upon them. He sent lions that killed many of them. And so they asked the king of Assyria to send somebody to teach them the customs of the God of that land so that the lions wouldn't kill them. <laughs> well, that's what the king did, but even after he had done that, the people still worshipped uh, their own gods. Now, gradually, we understand historically, the Samaritans gave up their idolatry and they adopted the Jewish religion, at least as best as they understood it. 
but they didn't understand it as well as they should. When Judah returned from captivity and the Samaritans wanted to join with them in the rebuilding of the temple, the Jews wanted nothing to do with them because they were not God's people. So the Samaritans actually built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. When that was eventually destroyed, historically, again, we read that they built another one at Shechem. But again, they were excluded from God's people. They did not know the Lord. God had not chosen them as His people. They did not know Him. They did not know how to worship Him. But as Jesus reminds us, the Jews knew who He was, and they knew how He was to be worshipped because they were God's people. Now, this evening, we need to see the importance of worshiping God in truth as well as in spirit because this is the kind of person that God is actually seeking. Now, I want us to consider four things of what it means to worship the Lord in truth. It means we must worship the true God. In other words, we have to know the truth regarding Him. That we need to worship according to His Word. God is the one who must reveal to us how we would approach Him. We must worship Him in the truth, well, I should say in, in, in truth, having truth in the innermost being. We have to uh, worship Him in sincerity and not hypocrisy. And we need to worship Him in the one who is the truth. We need to worship Him in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the kind of person that the Lord is seeking. So first of all, if we're going to worship God in truth, we must know the truth about God. I mean, that's the reason why He reveals Himself in the first place, because He wants us to know Him. He wants us to know what He is like and what He is pleased with. And He is not pleased if we have a wrong idea regarding Him in our minds. Now, we do need to realize that doesn't mean that we need to have a perfect idea of who, G of who God is, because we, we really can't. And sometimes uh, we can't help even our, our partial view of Him. I mean, if we happen to be young, it's still possible, of course, to love the Lord even as children, if the Lord should give us that grace. And even though children don't have a you know, fully developed mind, they can't understand what the Lord has revealed about Himself, God will still receive that. I mean, again, sometimes it can't be held. And also, when we first come to the Lord and we understand certain things about Him, but we don't know everything that we can know about Him, so sometimes we can't help... Uh, not having as, as full a picture of the Lord as we might possibly have. But sometimes we can help it. Sometimes we need to study more. I mean, think about this. If, if the Lord has given us His Spirit, if, if we truly love the Lord, doesn't it stand the reason that we'll also want to know Him? We'll want to know what He's like. We'll want to learn everything we can about Him so that we might honor Him. That's the reason why the Lord created everything that He made in the first place, the reason why He made the world, the reason why He made you, the reason why He reveals Himself as He does in the creation and through His Word is that He might be seen, that He might be known, and that He might be worshipped. So what is it that God wants us to know about Him as we study His Word? And again, that's one of the main reasons why we read the Bible is that we might get to know Him. Well, the Lord wants us to understand that in many ways that He is different than we are. Now, obviously, it's not like there's no point of contact between us and the Lord. The Lord has made us in His image, and there are certain ways in which we are like Him. We call those, of course, the um, uh, the attributes that we share in that are at least something like what God has, communicable attributes. He has made us in His image that we might know Him. But He also wants us to know that He is different than we are, that He is not man, that He doesn't share in our limitations, that there is no sin in Him. Again, the Lord reminds us on one occasion that God is not a man that He should repent or the Son of Man, that He should change His mind. I'm afraid with a lot of things that are said regarding God and regarding Jesus Christ in the church today, it tends to lower Him 
to a point where he's either nothing more than a slave who is sort of at our beck and call. If we just kind of, uh, you know, say these words or hold on to this particular promise that God has to serve us, or I've heard, you know, sermons where Jesus is treated as a man who is just sort of my friend, my, my buddy, I take him with me, I, he does things with me, and so forth. We need to understand that he is not like us, and he is not on our level. He is not like us, he is not like any other creature. Sadly, we were actually looking in, the, uh, in our uh, new members class today about one of the most, one of the, uh, well, I'd say one of the more serious sins that we can commit against the Lord is to lower Him to the level of a creature. And that's exactly what He tells us not to do in the second commandment when He says that you shall uh, not make for yourself any graven images, nothing, no image of what is in heaven above or the earth or, or uh, beneath and so forth. The Lord doesn't want to be made into the likeness of any of His creatures. God is a spirit. He is an infinite spirit. He doesn't have a body. He's not like us, and He's not like anything else. He is other than we are. He is the one who has no limitations. We use the term infinite to describe God because He is different than we are. We are limited in every way. He is unlimited. With regard to time, He is eternal. With regard to space, God is everywhere at once. With regard to power, he has limitless power. There's nothing that He can't do with regard to knowledge. God has infinite knowledge, comprehensive knowledge of everything that has been, will be, everything that is, and everything even that could be under any given set of circumstances. We call these things the natural attributes of God, limitless power and presence and knowledge. But of course, he wants us to know something else very important about Him, and that is that He is holy. And that is what we call His moral image. He has a perfect love of what is good. Now, if we are going to worship God in truth, we do need to understand the truth about God. We need to know the one whom we worship if we are to please the one we worship, if we have a false concept of God. We may be directing our worship in the wrong place to begin with, and we know that it is possible to be wrong enough about God to actually be worshiping a false God. So first of all, the Lord is seeking those who will worship Him in truth. In this sense, He is seeking those who will worship those who actually, or who, who worship the true God, the one who actually is, the one who reveals Himself in nature and in the Bible. He wants you to know who He is so that you might know how to approach Him. Now, secondly, if you would worship God, you need to worship according to truth. And basically, this is something else we saw in, the, uh, uh, well, in, in our class this morning. We cannot approach God in just any way that we would. The Samaritans really did not know how to approach Him. They did not have the true worship of God entrusted to them. And even if they had known, they didn't have a priesthood by which they could approach God because God had not set aside priests from the Samaritans. He had only done that from the Jews, the sons of Aaron. Of course, with the coming of the New Testament or the New Covenant, they can seek the Lord. As Jesus told the woman, an hour is coming and now is when those who worship the Lord or worship God, will worship Him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter where you are now. But one thing we do need to realize is that the form still matters. It's not the way it used to be, but it's still the way that God tells us He wants it to be. We have to come in the way that He tells us. Now, that's again what the second commandment is about. When the Lord tells us that we are not to make images of Him and worship Him in that way, that's one way, of course, in which we dishonor God by making Him to be other than He is. It also tells us that He would have us approach Him in a particular way, the way that He commands, the way that is pleasing to Him, not just any way that we might like to approach Him. Again, I mentioned this morning that, that, well, actually this afternoon, that Lutherans believe 
that we might do in worship whatever it is that God has not expressly forbidden. If He doesn't say we can't do it, then we can do it. But again, if God hasn't told us that we should do it, how can we know that what we're doing is pleasing to Him at all? God has to tell us what it is that He wants. He's told us that He doesn't want us to do it through images. That's not pleasing to Him. We saw an example actually in our class this afternoon that in, in the Bible, uh, Aaron's sons actually decided to be innovative in worship and offer to God something that He had not commanded. He hadn't forbidden it necessarily, but He hadn't commanded it. And when they did, the Lord struck them down because they tried to approach Him in a way He had not commanded. God would be worshipped in a certain way. If we're to worship Him in truth, we need to do it in the way that He has told us. And of course, the way that He has told us to do it is no longer, of course, through the uh, uh, ceremonial law. That's all been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. But now in the New Testament, that worship is more spiritual. I think in a sense, something of what the Lord was addressing when He says we have to worship Him in spirit and in truth, the kind of worship by which we approach Him, the kind of worship with which we worship Him is not, again, through a lot of physical trappings and through rituals, but our worship is spiritual. Reading His Word, hearing the preaching of His Word, praying to Him in the Spirit, uh, praising Him, again, by the help of the Spirit, receiving the sacraments, which, again, is perhaps the only physical part of our worship where the Lord gives to us now these signs to point to an invisible reality, which is, of course, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, if we are to worship the Lord in truth, we have to worship the true God and we have to uh, approach Him in the way that He tells us we must approach Him. But also remembering that worship is not just what we do in public worship, but worship is something that we are to be doing with our whole lives. This reminds us that we need to worship the Lord with our lives in the way that He commands. Again, we don't just simply do what we think might be pleasing to God. We do what He has commanded. Paul says we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, which means we are to devote ourselves to loving God and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And if we apply the regulative, you know, the regulative principle, which we apply to public worship to all of life, then what we should be doing, instead of asking whether or not something is okay to do, something is not sinful to do, we should ask ourselves instead, is this what God wants me to do? Is this what He has commanded? Is this His plan for my life? I think if we spent more time doing what we know God wants us to do, instead of wondering whether or not this is something that's allowable in, in Scripture, we're, we're going to be on much firmer ground. We need to treat life as we treat public worship. We shouldn't say that if God hasn't forbidden it, I can do it, but rather let's just simply do what He has commanded. Let's live the way He calls us to live for His glory. Now, if you are willing to worship the true God and if you are willing to worship Him in the way that He commands you to do, narrowly in public worship and broadly to live as He calls you to live, regardless of what other people do, regardless of what the world is doing, remembering that the Bible is the standard, not the world and not other believers, then you are the kind of person that God is looking for. He wants those who will listen and follow Him. That's what He seeks and, of course, He gives us the Spirit so that we might do that. Now, thirdly, to worship the Lord in truth means to worship in sincerity, to worship with a true heart, to be real before the Lord and not just to put on an act. Remember, it's possible, as the Pharisees have shown us over and over again and the scribes and the elders have as well, that it's possible to worship the Lord with a right form, but to have our hearts far from Him. When the Pharisees, even when they did what was right, they did it just so that others could see them. 
and praise them. The Lord would have us, when we worship Him, to be worshiping Him and to be seeking Him and to be doing that only. Now, there is a difficulty when it comes to that because um, all of us have something of the Pharisee, something of the scribe within our hearts. All of us like to be thought well of by other people. And when we gather together to worship, it's hard not to seek praise from other people. It affects the way that we behave because, again, we want to be perceived by others in in a favorable way. I mean, that's just the way we are. That's one of the reasons why Jesus tells us that when we do worship the Lord as much as possible, and I think this especially applies to worship in the broader sense, that we need to do it in secret. When we pray, you know, not to display ourselves, not to be standing on the street corners or even to, you know, uh, wax eloquent is, is perhaps one of the ways to put it when we're praying together. When we fast, you know, don't look miserable so that you appear fasting to others. When you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet. The Lord tells us that we need to do these things as much as possible in secret because others can't praise what they can't see. What He wants us to do is do it so that only God can see it, and then we will have our praise from Him. Now, that's easy to do when we're doing things in secret, but what about when we are doing things publicly and we can't uh, keep from others seeing what we're doing? What do we do when we meet together for worship? Well, if we are to worship the Lord in sincerity and in truth and not to be seen of other people, we need to make sure that as much as is possible, we are doing these things to be seen only of God. Again, sometimes we can't avoid it. Sometimes we have to see each other. Sometimes we have to hear each other, what what we're saying, what we're doing. But again, don't do what you do to be seen of men. Don't say what you say to be heard by others or to be uh, referred to in the prayer meeting. You know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, we we maybe begin to strive after that kind of thing. It's possible because of the pride of our hearts. We want to pray a prayer that might be referenced by somebody else because it's so impressive to them. We need to be careful we don't think along those lines. We need to try as much as is possible to speak directly to to God, to do it out of love for Him and a desire to honor Him and not to to bring honor to ourselves. Well, again, our Lord tells us that if that is your motive, if that's truly what you're seeking, to love Him and to honor Him and not to honor yourself, you are the kind of person that the Lord is looking for. He wants those that will worship Him. Worship Him in the way that He calls us to and to worship Him because you love Him and not because you're trying to gain attention for yourself. And then finally, if you're going to worship the Lord in truth, you need to worship through Jesus Christ. You need to worship in Jesus Christ who is the truth, as you've already seen in the hymn that we sung based upon John 14, 9. Jesus says... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that means, among other things, that if we are to worship the Lord in truth, we have to listen to Jesus Christ because He is the only authoritative interpreter of God, of who God is, and what it is that God wants. Uh, John writes in John 1.18, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Jesus is the one who reveals to us who the true God is. I mean, He's he's virtually the one who, well, who is God in human flesh. And so He shares that nature with God and He puts it on display in a way that we can see and understand so that we might understand who God is. He is the one who explains God through His life. He's the one who explains God through His Word. And I don't mean just the red letters in your Bible. You've got to remember that the whole Bible is the Word of God and all of it has been given through the Spirit of Christ. Jesus is the Word of God. It was His Spirit that moved the authors to write what they wrote so that we may know who He is 
and that we may know what it is He wants us to do, how we would worship Him. You know, our Lord is not just the truth, you know, who explains, you know, who God is to us, but He is also, the Scripture says, the mediator through whom we must offer all of our worship to God if it is to be accepted. Our sin has separated us from God. We need someone to stand in between us to reconcile us. The one that God has given to us is His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to worship through Him. I was talking with, um, uh, well, Maria today and, and just trying to summarize what it is the, the, the Roman church has actually done uh, to what the Lord has done. If you want to summarize everything that, that they have done, it's basically this. They have put the church in between Christ and you. They have put another mediator in between us that, that sort of brings us to Christ and that uh, gives to us what Christ gives us, but it has to go through the church both ways. Well, the Lord hasn't put the church in between us. He's given us the mediator, Jesus Christ. We can come directly to Him, and through Him, we can come directly to God. So if we are to worship God in truth, we do need to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's something else we don't often think about. If we are to worship God in truth, we also have to worship in Jesus Christ. You know, the old, in the Old Testament, God had commanded the building of a temple, and that temple had priests in it, and, and a man had to come, a woman had to come through those priests in order to be reconciled to God in the temple because that is where God dwells. But you know, that temple was a picture of Jesus Christ, even as the priesthood was a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the Jews in John 2, verses 19 through 21, tear down this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And of course, they mocked at him because he said, well, it took many years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But John tells us that Jesus meant the temple of His body because Jesus actually is the true temple. Now, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become a part of His body, and that body is a temple. We are like so many living stones that the Lord is building together into a temple to be inhabited by His Holy Spirit to offer to the Lord sacrifices which are of a spiritual nature. If we are to worship God, we have to worship in Jesus Christ as a part of His body if we are to be acceptable to the Lord. So basically, if we are to worship the Lord in truth, we have to be in Christ. If we are to be received by God as we worship Him, we have to offer what we offer to Him through Jesus Christ, and we have to do it in the way that our Lord Jesus Christ has told us Jesus is the truth, He is the mediator, He is the temple, the true temple of God. Nothing we will offer to God will ever be accepted except through Him. So if you would worship the Lord in truth, you do have to listen to Jesus Christ. You do have to worship through His mediation. You do have to offer your worship in Him. If you are willing to do this, then you are the one that God is looking for. And so to conclude this point this evening, I just want to say this, that in order to worship in spirit and in truth, we do need the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way we can do this. If you would worship in the Spirit of God, you have to come through Jesus Christ. You have to come to Him because He is the only one who can give you the Spirit. If you would worship in truth, you have to come to Christ again because He is the truth of God and the only way that our worship will be accepted. And so if you haven't come to Christ, remember that this is where you have to start. Repent and trust in the Lord. Jesus is the one who reveals the Father. Jesus is the one who tells us how to worship. Jesus is the one who can cleanse your heart and make your worship sincere. He is the one that can make your worship acceptable. That is the reason why you need Jesus Christ if you are to worship in the Spirit and in truth. But let's not forget the point that if 
we have come to Christ, if we have trusted, if we have repented, then we need to seek to be filled with the Spirit of God in order to do what the Lord calls us to do. He says God is looking for those who worship in spirit and in truth. Now, it's one thing to know the truth, to know what God wants, but it's another thing to actually want to do it. To the degree that you are filled with the Spirit of God, to that degree you will want to worship the Lord in the way that He wants you to worship Him. And of course, the more that you are willing to do this, not only in public worship but with your life, the more willing you are to do His will and the more you actually do that, the more it's going to put you on the Lord's radar, the more the Lord is going to use you. Now again, let's remember what life is really all about. It's not for us. It's not to seek our own pleasure, to seek our own fun, to seek our own thrills, to grab as much gusto as we can in life. The only thing that's going to matter when life is over and we're standing before the Lord is what we have done for Him. So if you want to do as much as you might possibly do, then you need to listen to what it is that the Lord wants you to be and what He wants you to do. Among other things, He wants you to be filled with His Spirit and He wants you to worship Him through that love of the Spirit according to His truth. To the degree that you do that, to that degree, God will use you. And as He uses you, you will be storing up rewards in heaven. That's what life is all about. So may the Lord grant us the grace to be able to do that. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's